Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Greg Fisher. I'm a faculty member at WPI and part of the AIM Lab, the Automation and Interventional Medicine Robotics uh, Research Laboratory. And I'm also director of the uh, Practice Point uh, R&D Center for uh, Accelerating uh, Med Device Development that's funded by the, uh, the state of Massachusetts. Uh, as some of you guys may know, my uh, primary research area is in uh, medical robotics, primarily uh, surgical robots. Uh, that being said, uh, I'm really a, a pleasure to be a part of this uh, special session today on you know, how we can use uh, mechatronics and robotics for assisting with infectious diseases. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you today about some of our efforts in uh, how we can create emergency use um, authorized devices, in particular our work on ventilators and uh, emergency resuscitators. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, just to see uh, the context that we're coming from, you know, our research areas in healthcare robotics, this is a broad spectrum. I know some of the folks here are very involved in medical robotics. So for some folks, this might not be um, the area that you're most familiar with. Uh, I like to classify these in different areas. And if we think of it that way, we have more of these interventional systems, image guided systems, surgical systems. That's what I'm showing on the left. Um, on the top, I'm showing these rehabilitative assistive devices, wearable devices, human augmentation devices. Uh, on the right, we're talking more about socially assistive robotics, telepresence systems, uh, patient transport systems, all sorts of um, kind of direct patient interaction, but not in kind of a surgical uh, way. Um, and on the bottom, it's a little bit further removed, but things like process automation, how can you automate lab tests and assays and transport logistics, things like that. Um, the reason I'm showing this slide is when it comes to mechatronics and uh, infectious diseases or in general just managing um, care, all of these areas have um, places where they can have a huge impact in how we can improve things, especially under the current conditions. So, for example, on the surgical side, you might not, not think of it this way, but this actually allows, for example, people to be spread out more in the operating room. So the surgeon, for example, can be on the other side of the room. Uh, so you don't have this issue of everybody being congested in the same area. It also distances many of the people in the OR from the patients. So there's advantages, for example, to doing whether it's remote interventional uh, surgery like you do with a da Vinci type system or even uh, robotic biopsy type systems where now the patient can be a little bit further removed from the other uh, clinical staff. So there are actually advantages on that side. Uh, on the rehab and wearable side, of course, if you can avoid patient contact, there's some big advantages in that area um, or at least minimize patient contact and then have some sort of either uh, automated or uh, remote controlled devices. On the right side, there's a huge um, opportunity as well. So these ideas socially system robots, so telehealth is really taking off these days, uh, and I think it's just really giving an indication of where this is going to go in the future. There's a tremendous uh, impact there, and that's both just, you know, these relatively simple video type devices or taking vital signs to more advanced devices that can actually uh, do more diagnosis like robotic ultrasound or more direct interactions with the patients or things like palpation and whatnot. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities in that area. And then, of course, the behind the scenes side, more on the lab side and automation and logistics, there's a tremendous potential as well because this avoids um, potentially more human to human interactions and can also just increase the efficiency and increase the, uh, the available workforce uh, if, if necessary. And then in my lab, again, to see a little more context, we do work in all of these different types of areas. Um, I think most of you may be most familiar with work on surgical robots. So on the bottom right, I'm showing a MRI compatible robot for doing uh, brain cancer therapy. We also do work in prostate cancer. And the idea here is, you know, can we do, for example, biopsies or therapy delivery inside of an imaging system? Again, in general, that wasn't developed uh, in such a way that we, you know, I guess a huge advantage for being infectious diseases, but what it does is it does actually detach the surgeon from the patient somewhat. So it allows you to do your planning uh, more remotely. Uh, if you want to, you can do this in more of a point and click type fashion, and though we've typically avoided that because the clinicians generally like to be as involved in as possible and having their hands you know, on the needles, we can, for example, drive needles for biopsies with the clinician either um, remotely and possibly even outside the room if we, uh, if we wanted to and if they were comfortable doing so. Uh, on the top there, we're showing a Vinci surgical system. Uh, we developed open source uh, hardware and software frameworks uh, with a whole bunch of collaborators and are kind of a key component in this network of the DaVinci Surgical Research Kit. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work on kind of surgical autonomy. We do work on social robots. So if you see down here, this is just a caricature, but um, we have a penguin type robot. It's a little humanoid robot for interacting with um, children that have autism and other pervasive developmental disabilities. This is an area where there actually is a tremendous opportunity because as students are not being able to be in school uh, or not being able to be with their peers or not being able to be with their teachers, having sort of social type robots that allow us to interact with the children uh, and ensure this continuation of care is uh, very, very important. 
uh, and then also assistive devices. So what I was showing up here is actually a soft robotic glove that was intended for people that have had um, strokes or other neuromuscular disorders to help them with uh, closing and opening opening, in particular in this case, opening their, uh, their hand. Um, but these types of devices can also be used in a, in a rehab type setting. So that way you can actually provide therapy without as much physical contact. Uh, and then also um, giving people more independence is going to be really important if uh, we're trying to avoid uh, contact with people that might have uh, infections, for example. And this is pretty much showing the same thing, but with some, uh, some real photos to give a better idea of what we've been uh, up to and what we work on. I did want to give a little bit of information on the types of, uh, you know, the work that we're doing at WPI now on trying to how we accelerate uh, development. And the most important one here is that we developed a practice point. This is a new uh, R&D center that was funded by the state of Massachusetts. And essentially what we did is we took uh, all of the aspects that we felt were important of a hospital setting and we dropped them in an engineering school. So this is different than what some other sites have done where they've tried to bring engineers to the hospital. This lets us have a real engineering setting. We have CNC manufacturing capabilities. Uh, we have all sorts of uh, test capabilities. We have all of our offices and labs on the adjacent floors, and we have uh, an operating room uh, with CRM capabilities, lead lined walls, motion capture capabilities. We have a fully functional, brand new state of the art 3T MRI scanner. Uh, we have motion capture in a uh, rehab type suite, force plates in the floors and whatnot. Um, we have a patient care suite, we have a mock apartment. So really the whole idea was to have all of these different settings that we felt would be useful for accelerating development. And this is the kind of thing that's really important for when emergencies come up, how can we actually really quickly develop develop and test devices and um, try them out in the most realistic settings possible. And again, just to give you an idea of, uh, you know, this new facility that we've been working on. And all of these areas um, are places where there's tremendous opportunities. As I mentioned, I focus more on the mechatronics side of things and the medical robotics, but also when it comes to data analysis, uh, cybersecurity, tying all these uh, smart devices together, there's tremendous opportunities that we can um, really try to explore, um, especially now um, in this current system situation that we're in where there's really a need. All right, so let me get into the um, meat, if you will, this presentation. Um, as you know, especially a few months ago, there was a huge concern that there wouldn't be enough uh, mechanical ventilators, uh, so devices to help people breathe. Uh, I believe we're fortunate enough that at least in the US, it seems for at least for the time being, um, we're uh, in good shape in that area, although who knows, that's possible to change. Um, that's not necessarily the case in other parts of the world, which is why it's been really important to um, continue to push forward on this effort, because the idea is that if somebody is having trouble breathing, um, the best way to deal with them in many cases is to have some sort of mechanical device that can help breathe for them. And there's a lot of different ways that that can be done, different ways that it can be cooked up, different capabilities. Uh, but in general, these are called mechanical ventilation, um, and it's either a, a ventilator or a resuscitator that's typically used for, for doing that. And the bottom line is you have a device, it's trying to put a fresh air into the patient, so that's oxygenated air into the patient, and it needs to get the used or the carbon uh, dioxide laden air out of the patient. And those are really the primary functions. So if we look in a little bit more detail here, you know, we're trying to get the atmospheric oxygen, and it might be higher than that if you have an external oxygen tank. We want to get that into the lungs, you want to get into the bloodstream, and then and you got to get to the tissues, and then we need to get the carbon dioxide out of the body. And that's really, really important, and both of those need to be happening. So just because you're getting oxygen in, if you're not getting the carbon dioxide out, you have a problem, right? If we're just getting carbon dioxide out and we're not bringing a high enough level of oxygen in, you're also going to have problems. So how can we do this? So there's actually a, a number of different types of mechanical ventilation devices, and I just wanted to throw these up to, you know, let people know that may not be as familiar with the field. So first off, there's invasive and non-invasive. So generally, non-invasive is a mask, you know, and, it, and usually, at least for uh, ventilators, that's you know, a mask that's very tightly attached to the face, but there's no tube going down into the um, into the into the throat. Um, and invasive ventilation is where you actually intubate the patient with an endotracheal tube, typically, uh, and the tube goes direct to the lungs. Uh, it is important, for example, that you need to make sure that that tube actually was inserted properly, sealed, sealed properly, and in the right place. So there's some opportunities for doing sensing and whatnot to ensure that that's actually happened. Um, there's positive pressure, negative pressure devices. Most modern devices are positive pressure devices, meaning they're actually applying active pressure uh, down through the trachea and into the lungs. Uh, negative pressure devices are more like what you might have seen with these uh, iron lungs, which are these giant tubes that patients are in, and they can create a vacuum that actually uh, essentially sucks the um, cavity larger and, and expands the lungs. Uh, I've also seen some more portable type devices that look almost like a little bit of a suit of armor that you can put on to do that. And there may be scenarios where that, 
that's valuable as well. But most of the devices that people are developing for emergency ventilation are the positive pressure devices. Um, you can do pressure control devices, which mean they control the pressure profile in the lungs. You can do volume control devices that control the volume control in the lungs or the um, trajectory, if you will, or the flow pattern. Um, then, then there's also combinations that are volume controlled, but with pressure limits or pressure controlled with volume limits. Um, and then uh, you can do things that are timed, meaning they have a fixed profile uh, and that may or may not change over time automatically. Um, and then you can also have patient triggered devices for, for people that are breathing themselves. It's really important that the machine is synchronized with uh, what's going on actually um, with the ventilator itself because if the ventilator is not breathing at the same rate that in itself can cause problems. Uh, I wanted to throw off a few links out there since I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with this. Um, the FDA has this uh, emergency use authorization program and there's uh, select devices that they've made these authorizations for. Um, you can go on their uh, website, and this will be evolving over time. Um, and you know, presumably in different scenarios, there would be different devices that uh, come up here as well, and things will come and go off of this list. But the idea is that you can get temporary approvals. Now, these are not approvals that you know. If you get approved through this in the future, you'll be able to keep selling devices. You'll still have to go through the traditional path down the road if you want to market these devices. But there are ways to, at least relative to a typical FDA process, get things on the market as quickly as possible. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to pull up all the documents themselves, so I've put the, uh, the links on here. And if you go up to the website, you can just uh, follow these as well. But there's a, a, a template that's available of what you would submit for uh, emergency ventilators. But what you'll see, very much like a typical FDA submission, is it's very open-ended and up to the applicant to fill in the information on there. You need to more or less say what you think is important, justify why that's important, um, and then uh, prove that you actually are doing what you said you were going to do, right? And there's a little bit of guidance in there, but it doesn't necessarily say everything. And one of the main reasons for that is the and so based on whatever you decide is your indication, that can drastically change what it is that you need to demonstrate. And that's the same would be true for emergency use authorization as well. That being said, uh, there's an organization called uh, AAMI uh, and a number of folks that uh, worked on this put together a set of guidelines or guidances uh, of what are typical expectations and requirements for a number of devices, in particular emergency use resuscitators and emergency use ventilators. So what this does is this gives you a set of guidelines of if you're to follow the indications that they are pointing out, which may or may not be the same ones that you're doing, then you can follow these and it'll give you a pretty good idea of what you should be filling into that template, what are the design parameters you should be shooting for, and what kind of validation should you be doing to make sure that they're actually appropriate. Uh, and again, this has been uh, evolving. I've seen a number of iterations, uh, so you should take a look at it. And on here in particular, there are a number of documents, at least this is what was on there when I took the uh, screenshot. This may have evolved um, over time. As I said, I've seen these number of uh, iterations, revisions, uh, updating. And the ones that uh, I'm most interested in are um, emergency use resuscitators. And in under this, and really under all of these, there's design guidance, which is essentially design requirements and then end user disclosures, which is another important document because these are the things that you would need to let a physician or clinician know because you may or may not be meeting all the same requirements of a, a typical non-emergency device. You'll also see they broke up uh, EUVs and EURs. So what's the difference between a ventilator and a resuscitator? And you need to take a look at that. In general, they're classifying resuscitators as these uh, bags, as bag squeezers, and ventilators as more traditional ventilators. But if you're in a gray area, you would need to clarify what it would actually fall under. And you should be careful to use the appropriate terminology. And then there's also um, test reports and testing uh, guidelines as well on the website. So there's some nice documents on here that you can check out. And I highly recommend doing this. Uh, again, it just gives you a really good idea of you know, what you should be shooting for and what targets you should be shooting for. Um, so as I said, these EURs are re re referring to these AMBU bag type uh, squeezer devices. Uh, and they're meant for typically for resuscitation, typically done manually. Um, and they can be done either in a hospital setting or an ambulance emergency type setting. Um, but I did want to point this out. And what I wrote in red is very, very important. This is a guidance. It's not necessarily the regulatory requirements in itself. Uh, you're on your indication of use. So if you're, if you're coming up with what is your indication of use, and it might be, you know, in fact, one of our original applications was something we would want to use you know, as a transport ventilator in an ambulance where you always have somebody monitoring the system. And it's still always one person on the machine, very similar to the way it would be if it was manual, just to give you more consistent compressions over potentially long rides and avoiding fatigue. So in that scenario, that may be very different than if you're going to be putting an automated device on a patient that's 
can be left overnight in an ICU because the different types of monitoring requirements, for example, might be very different. So you need to think about what are your indications for use and justify uh, what are the requirements you have and verify that you actually meet those. I also wanted to point this out that if anybody's interested in following this further, there's a, number, a lot of information online. What I found to be a really great resource is there's an edX course put together by uh, Harvard um, related to mechanical ventilation for COVID-19. I believe it's actually intended for physicians that don't typically do ventilation uh, to get them up to speed, but it's a really, really great course. And uh, if you want to proceed, uh, do further work in this area, I highly recommend you check it out. So we can dig in a little bit more. This is a screen of a typical commercial ventilator, uh, and it gives you an idea of the kinds of parameters. And what you'll see is there's a lot of different parameters on here that you can set. And you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to dig too, too much in detail because I'd like to show you the designs that we've been working on. But uh, the important ones are, you know, you have the PIP, which is your peak pressure, right? So that's going to be the top of your pressure graphs. There's PEEP, which is your minimum pressure. Essentially, you want to leave some pressure in the lungs, and that helps with the absorption of the, uh, the oxygen. Um, though if your PIP is too high, that means the delta, or the change in pressure, is not as much, which means you're likely going to have a less change in flow, and you're going to get rid of potentially less carbon dioxide. So it's a trade-off there, again, of getting more oxygen in and getting more carbon dioxide out. And these are parameters that uh, I just want to put a quick disclaimer. I'm not a physician. I'm not telling you what parameters to pick or how you should pick parameters. I'm trying to give you an indication of what the different types of parameters do. Um, so the other parameters on here are tidal volume, You can look, which is the total, the amount of volume that's uh, put in and out with every breath. Uh, respiration rate, um, the intervals, uh, and then the, the inspiration interval. And what you can vary, for example, is what they call it the uh, inspiration expiration ratio as well, which effectively is how much time are you putting air in and how much time are you letting the air go out, for example. Uh, and then things like oxygen. And this is showing 21%. So this is likely working at room air. But if you were to hook up an oxygen tank, you can get up to 100%. 100% obviously gives you more oxygen in. Uh, in an emergency situation, that would probably fine but it's also there's side effects to working on 100 percent oxygen for an extended period of time because the body is not really uh intended to operate on that uh, range so you need to begin to be careful about that so what are some of the parameters we can adjust well if we want to get co2 out that's mostly based on this idea of what they call minute ventilation which is your respiratory rate multiplied by your tidal volume so how many breaths per minute and how big is your breath so those are the two parameters primarily that adjust removing the carbon dioxide and then we want to get more oxygen oxygen in, and that's primarily based on how much pressure do you keep leaving in the lungs, that's what we call the PEEP, and um, how much oxygen is actually in the air that you're breathing. And there are other parameters as well, but these are really important ones. And then you also need to take into account things like the stiffness of the lungs, right? You can't just increase the respiratory rate um, while maintaining the tidal volume because you're not going to have time to fully exhale, for example, or maybe the pressures will get too high. Or if you ramp up the pressure too high, that can also cause problems, or if you don't leave enough time to exhale. So there's a lot of other factors that go into it, but these are the ones that have the biggest effect, for example, on bringing oxygen in and getting carbon dioxide out. And what you'll notice here is there's probably three parameters you want to adjust, but you can actually only have two that you can adjust independently and the third one follows, right? So there's how much time do you want to inhale? How much time do you have to leave to exhale? And how fast can you repeat this cycle? So that's the important thing to keep in mind. And that's going to be dependent on the patients and you know, mechanical properties of the lung, among other things. I wanted to show this slide that I pulled out of that um, edX lecture, uh, mostly just to give you an idea of where the volume should land. So if you were to take this range of six to eight milliliters per kilogram of how much air you need to pump into somebody's lungs, for you know, a typical 65 kilogram person, that turns out to be somewhere between 390 to 520 milliliters, just to give you a, a sense of scale of you know, how big should a breath be. So if we look at something like this, this is the emergency type uh, bag valve squeeze mask, uh, bag valve mask or Ambu bag uh, resuscitator. Typically these are squeezed manually, but these are used all the time. And the main reason why we found it really important to base it off of something like this is if you can maintain all or at least most of the air pathway um, with traditional parts that are commercially available and already approved, uh, the regulatory pathway and the safety is significantly higher. Uh, for example, if you were to put your own components in here, uh, then suddenly you need to worry about biocompatibility and particulates and uh, other sorts of approvals when you start doing your uh, FDA submissions and just in general to make sure that it's safe. Um, there's, so there's filters on here. This particular one shows a CO2 sensor. This is not our device. This is just a uh, stock photo image. Uh, and then these peep valves, which lets you show the pressure. 
uh, sorry, it lets you adjust the, uh, the pressure that's remaining in the lungs. So this is what these Ambu bag looks like. I think a lot of you have probably seen these before. Uh, and essentially this mask can come off if we're, um, and use a tube, an uh, endotracheal tube when you intubate a patient uh, if you're doing this with invasive uh, ventilation. Um, there's typically one-way valve. So essentially if the pressure in here is higher than the pressure inside the lungs, the air is going into the lungs. If somebody's exhaling, whether it's actively or passively because your lungs just uh, are essentially compressing and pushing the uh, old air back out, the carbon dioxide laden air out. Um, if the pressure is higher on this side, it vents out over here. Um, a really, really important aspect to keep in mind, especially with uh, infected patients, is you know these devices are really designed for emergency use of somebody that, for example, needs uh, you know CPR in the field, right? Um, in that case, usually we just exhaust their um, exhaled air into the atmosphere. That's a major, major problem in these COVID patients. So we need to find ways to contain that air, and that's one of the things that we focused on is how can we actually adapt these devices and create, you know, for example, 3D printed devices that are on the exhalation pathway, so they're not affecting the air going into the patient. They don't have the same regulatory requirements, but how do we redirect that air go coming out to go through a filter and possibly go through other sensing devices? Uh, so there's a lot of parameters we need to go through, things like the uh, inspiration-expiration ratios. These are pulled off of that uh, AME functional requirements. Again, your indication might affect these. Uh, things like the respiratory rate, the tidal volumes, and as I said, filtering is really, really important. So what we came up with is a design that looks a lot like this, and there's some variants on this design. We've made some iterations, um, but the whole point was we're trying to create a device that can be used um, and assembled pretty much anywhere in the world using a variety of manufacturing technologies and a variety of materials. So there are quite a few groups, um, both in our um, area as well as scattered around the country and around the world that are working on different types of um, emergency ventilators and emergency resuscitators. One of the problems uh, that a lot of people are having is, can you actually source the materials that you need? Uh, whether it's the actual raw materials or whether it's microcontrollers or sensors or whatever it happens to be, our goal was to try to create something that we can create out of a variety of different materials. So this particular device, you can create it out of uh, stock aluminum sheets. You could create it out of uh, acrylic plastic. You could create it out of polycarbonate. You could create it out of wood, although probably not ideal for um, cleanliness purposes. You can cut it using water jet cutting. You could cut it using laser jet cutting. You could use uh, CNC routers. You can use furniture making equipment for that matter to, to assemble this device. So our goal was you know, really anywhere in the world, in particular under-resourced areas, we want to make sure that you have the ability to manufacture these devices, minimize part counts. Um, if somebody's ma making this, we want to make it as easy to transport as possible. So for example, our prototype, we ended up doing laser cut out of acrylic, as a lot of you guys do for prototyping. Um, for what I would say is the optimal design, it's water jet cut out of sheets of aluminum. And that's what we've actually prepared. Um, I have 10 units that were made made doing it that way. Um, uh, but also things like doing CNC routers are very common for furniture manufacturing and there's advantages there. Uh, also on the electronic side, we're trying to minimize any electronics on there using um, the ability to put different types of motors in there and different types of control electronics in there and using the most common ones available. In this case, I'll dig in a little bit more, but uh, windshield wiper motors turn out to be uh, ideal for this because they're very readily available. They're very similar. You can have slightly different hole patterns to accommodate different devices uh, and they're perfect for a doing one rotation and then waiting, which is exactly what we want to do here. Uh, I'm not going to dig down to this because I just said this, but essentially the idea is we want to create this as simple as possible. We want to avoid any sort of software and custom electronics that are on here. That was a design requirement that we put on this, which is a little bit different than a number of other groups because we wanted to make this available anywhere and not trying to track down a particular microcontroller or a particular controller. Uh, and it's very mechanically driven. Um, so you adjust, for example, the shape of the cam to change respiratory profile files. You can change the time delays of the cam to adjust respiratory rates. You can change essentially the lever arms to change the tidal volumes. So it's all very mechanically driven and uh, you can control this through essentially 12 volt power from a vehicle or a battery type setup. So this is a prototype of the device here. We've uh, ran off 10 of these units so we can start doing some more uh, in-depth testing. And you can see it takes the commercially available devices. Uh, it's all, um, in this case, uh, water jet cut uh, aluminum sheets. Uh, we have the commercially available valves, for example, on here, but then we've added adapters and I'll show you what we do with these adapters, but they redirect all the exhaust air, which can go through filters. Um, there's pressure monitors on here. Again, these are not electronic pressure monitors. These are commercially available ones that actually come with the Embu bags. And in a monitored scenario, that lets you keep an eye on it. Uh, you could very easily replace these with electronic ones if you needed to, and if you were able to actually get them, which is a big uh, concern. 
And we thought that this was a really important aspect as well as how can we actually distribute these easily. So we've been calling it kind of a flat pack uh, components, almost like uh, when you go buy furniture, for example, that all these parts can be cut, laid flat, and very easily shipped. Um, so they could be, you know, made somewhere and packed up into a pallet. You can get a large number of these very easily delivered somewhere. And they're also very, very straightforward and easy to uh, assemble. Uh, so this is what the system looks like here. Um, this is a particular device working off a uh, car battery. It's actually a marine battery. These deep cycle batteries are designed to uh, run much lower in terms of their capacity. Uh, and essentially the idea here, as you can see, the cam shape can be changed to change the uh, respiratory profile. The time delay can change the respiratory rate. Um, this piece actually moves up and down to change the uh, lever arm, essentially where this cam hits this lever, which changes the volume. And you can also change the base location of the, uh, the lever to change that as well. Uh, so these are some of the components. We already kind of dug into this, but again, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. And here you give an idea of, you know, IDE can be changed by, uh, or respiratory profile can be changed by the shape of the cam. We actually wrote MATLAB scripts where if you plug in parameters, so they'll actually spit out cam shapes. And then we can take these cam shapes and we can cut them on the water jet cutter or the laser cutter or on a CNC router, for example. And these are small enough that you can actually even do these on you know, a hobby CNC uh, router to change cam profiles, for example. And you could have a kit of different cams that just go on with one volt, for example, if you want to swap it out really, really quickly. Um, you can change the title volume by, for example, taking this and putting it into different holes. Um, rather than having a slider, we use discrete holes because then we can actually have settings that are calibrated for each of these settings. But you could also just as easily slit it. You get more variability, but it's harder to get a tune in a precise value. Um, you can adjust the lever arm, the base of the device, and that again gives you more information of where you're set up. And that changes the volume as well. And then on the electronics side, we're using uh, window motors. So these are available pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, all of them are, or most of them are pretty similar. There's actually whole patterns on the device for two of the most common ones uh, near us. Uh, we work with an auto parts supplier, but you can just simply put a couple different hole patterns. You can put a different motor on there. Uh, and then in terms of timing it, we're using an asymmetric uh, timer from industrial automation. So there's tons of these that are out there from all sorts of different vendors. And all it does, it lets you set an off time and an on time. And essentially the, uh, the off time, or the, sorry, the short on time is just the pulse to get it moving. And then the off time is more or less the delay until it does the next cycle. These, these motors are designed to automatically do one full revolution and wait. In fact, you could probably even use a, a standard um, windshield wiper uh, intermittent timer out of a vehicle if you could uh, extract it appropriately. We found these industrial timers work great. You could also use any microcontroller and a relay uh, and do it that way as well. So these are the types of motors that we particularly use, but most of them would work. The very similar ones would work. Uh, we powered it off of batteries. Again, we felt this was really important. You could run it directly off a vehicle. You can run it for a very extended period of time off of uh, you know, marine type uh, batteries and you use adapters. Uh, we did validation of the timing so that you can actually look inside these motors and they're kind of cool to look in there, but there's wipers and these tracks don't go all the way around and you can set it up essentially so that one pulse of the timer makes it do one full revolution. It always stops in exactly the same spot. And then the other time delay on so the, set, the other knob on the relay lets you set the delay, which set, sets the respiratory rate. And again, the cam shape defines how fast and slow the inspiration, the expiration is when it's happening at that rate. Um, so the entire electrical system is literally just a motor and an industrial timer, which could be a variety of different components. So again, this was really important in terms of our design requirements, which is a bit different than what we typically do for anyone that knows our research. You know, our day job is developing custom uh, robot controllers. We've developed uh, control systems for the DaVinci surgical robot. We develop uh, control systems for MRI robots. We really took the exact opposite track here to try to create as absolutely simple as possible using as few custom components as possible because we felt that was really important to be able to get this distributed to a network of manufacturers around the world, especially again in under-resourced areas. And this is what the system looks like. Uh, and as I mentioned, we need to find ways to add um, um, redirection of the air coming out. So this is a 3D printed device that we designed that actually snaps right onto the commercially available PEEP adapters. So as you exhale, instead of the air just getting blown out into the atmosphere, all the exhaled air gets redirected through this tube and we can plug in filters and we can plug in sensors into there, for example. So right here we can put sensors and these designs, we'll post them online so others can use them as well. And if you look at this quickly, this will be uh, 
a, a video showing what's going on. As we run the unit, you can see the pressure. And if you come and you adjust the peak valve setting, again, these are standard commercially available peak valves, you'll end up with hitting more or less that same number. And if you tighten that down, you're going to see it's going to leave more residual pressure inside the lungs. And if you turn it back, it'll adjust the other way. Now, filtering is important. So this is why we added this device primarily. By putting this on there, now we can add filters and we can do this on the exhalation pathway. So we're not affecting anything that's going on on the air from the device into the patient and then they exhale back out, and after it's gone through the one-way valve, then we can put the filters. Uh, and then that also lets us put sensors on there. And this was a, a prototype that's come a little bit way since then, but this device goes on here and it can measure carbon dioxide. And we used you know, $50 uh, atmospheric sensors uh, for measuring carbon dioxide that actually have a pretty good bandwidth, fast enough to measure the inspiration and expiration profiles. And that gives you an idea of how good is the ventilation actually working for the patient, right? If you're not getting an increase and decrease in CO2 with every breath, um, and you're not getting a, a higher CO2 value in the exhaled breath than what's in the, uh, the atmosphere, then you know you're not actually ventilating the person well. You're not getting good air exchange in the lungs. It can also detect if the endotracheal tube wasn't uh, appropriately inserted. So essentially, this is what we've developed. I'd be happy to talk to anybody out there. Um, about you know, how we can try to expand these, modify these, get a development community on these, and also try to get them into other people's hands. So I'll just wrap up with some uh, information here if you want to follow up further. Again, uh, uh, Greg Fisher, here's my email address. Shoot me an email. I'd be to interact with anybody. Uh, if anybody's in work, interested in working with our R&D center and wants to come out and visit some point when we're actually allowed to all get together again, uh, I'd love to host you out in Worcester. We're right outside of Boston. Um, and then here are two websites with some information. Um, we're still populating these, but pretty soon we should have information on these. This is kind of just more general information. And then we have a GitHub site where we're going to be posting all the mechanical designs. As I said, there's no actual software on there. Uh, and then uh, in our lab, we do a lot of open source software, things for um, motion capture, for rehab devices, for the Da Vinci surgical system, uh, surgical robot simulators, um, communication protocols and whatnot. So if anybody's interested in them, uh, feel free to check out our other uh, software packages. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. So. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, uh, we have an interesting uh, set of sessions today. I'm looking forward to it. And you know, don't hesitate to uh, follow up if you have any questions.